Amen. Amen. Well, it's great to be here tonight in uh, VBC Fresno. And uh, it's great to see the big crowd that we have here. And of course, I'm grateful to see Brother Jared and Miss Heidi and their family. And they were a huge blessing in our church, and they're a great blessing here. So please pray for them and support them and just take care of them because, you know, they really helped us out. And so it's good to see them. And I'm grateful for their friendship and for the great work that they're doing here. So it's good to be here. And so we're there in Daniel chapter number one. And if you look at verse number one again, Daniel 1, the Bible says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And of course, as we begin Daniel chapter number one, we begin with King Nebuchadnezzar doing what? Taking the children of Judah into captivity, into Babylon. And of course, one of those people who gets taken is Daniel. Look, if you would, at verse number three, it says in verse three, it says, And the king, that's Nebuchadnezzar, spake unto Ashton as the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes. Verse 4, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. So here we see that Nebuchadnezzar, he wants the best of the best. He wants the cream of the crop. It's not enough to take just the whole nation. No, he wants to take children who are the best, who are skillful in learning, skillful in knowledge. And notice the purpose at the end of verse 4. It says, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And of course, one of these people who gets taken is Daniel. But the whole goal, the point of Nebuchadnezzar taking, the, taking someone like Daniel was to do what? Was to teach them the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. You see, the goal for Nebuchadnezzar with Daniel and, and his friends was to take them and to change what they had been taught in Judah. It was to change what they had learned from the law of God. It was to change their, even their vocabulary, their speech, to assimilate them to the culture of Babylon. And in the same way, you in this room, you know, if you're saved, you have to understand that the king of Babylon, Satan, wants to take you and wants to change you. He wants to conform you into a Babylonian, to change the way you should speak, to change what you should be doing for God, to make you be like one of them. And so understand that salvation is only the beginning. You know, just because you're saved doesn't mean you're done. Understand that Satan, the king of Babylon, he wants to take you and he wants to make you learn the way of Babylon, make you learn the learning of the Chaldeans, make you learn how they speak, how they live, to change the way that God wants you to be. Look at verse number six. It says, Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Verse seven, Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah, of Shadrach, and to Mishael, of Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. And so the goal, as we see, was to take them and to change them from being people who were of God's people, of the nation of Judah, to now conforming them to being of the world, to be of Babylon. And so understand that there's a goal today to change you as well. But notice, notice what Daniel does in verse number 8. It says in Daniel 1, it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. It said that Daniel, he did what? That he purposed in his heart. And today I'm preaching on Daniel's purpose in his heart. See, what is a purpose? A purpose is an intention or is an objective. It's something that you choose to do in your life. And in life, we ought to make purposes in life. And here we see that Daniel, he purposed. He chose his intention, his objective in Babylon was to not defile himself. See, Daniel was a man with character who said, you know what, I'm not going to change the way I am. I'm not going to defile myself to please the world, defile myself to please the king of Babylon. I'm going to stay who I am, stay true to the Bible, stay true to the word of God. And it began where? It began with a purpose, where? In his heart. And we see the character of a man like Daniel, a character that says, you know what? It makes no difference what my friends are doing. It makes no difference what anyone else is going to do. I'm going to purpose to do what God wants me to do. And tonight as Christians, even if you're saved, you have a purpose in your heart to make decisions to follow the Lord regardless, no matter what. It makes no difference what your family does. It makes no difference what your friends do. It makes no difference what the king of Babylon or what the Babylonians want to do. You have a purpose in your heart to live for God, to be a man of God or a woman of God, and to stay true to what God wants you to be. Because you have to understand that there's an agenda tonight to change you, to assimilate you, to do what? To look, to conform your life like the image of the Babylonians, to look like one of the world. And so tonight I'm preaching on the purposes of your heart. You ought to have purposes, objectives, intentions in your heart, things that will not change no matter what. 
where you decide, this is who I am, this is what I'm going to do, but it begins with a decision where it begins in a, in a choice in your heart. And it's something only you can do. One thing I've learned for myself in my life and that I've noticed is that I cannot force someone to make those intentions. I cannot impose intentions on my kids. I cannot make those decisions for my wife or for my family. They have to do it on their own. In the same way you, nobody can force you to make those decisions in your heart. You must come to the place where you decide to be like Daniel, purpose in your heart to not change, to be what God wants you to be. Stay true to the Word of God and purpose in your heart that no matter what anyone else does, you will be true to the Bible. And so tonight I'm preaching on the purposes of your heart. And in this chapter, in Daniel chapter 1, we see four things that I, 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 want, I want to take away and show you of things that you ought to purpose in your life. And so number one, tonight you ought to purpose to live the Christian life. You ought to purpose to, number one, live the Christian life. Look at verse number 8 again, Daniel 1, 8. The Bible says, it says, But Daniel, notice, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. I want you to notice how it says, it says that Daniel purposed in his heart, notice, that he would not defile himself. You see, Daniel did not wait for the meat to come. Daniel did not wait for the wine to come. Daniel did not wait to make that choice and decide, you know what, now that the meat's in front of me, now that the wine's in front of me, what am I going to do? No, Daniel purposed in his heart before the option even became available. Before the wine showed up, before the meat showed up, Daniel had already decided what he was going to do. He was already purposed in his heart. And about the Christian life is that the only way you live the Christian life is on purpose. You must purpose in your life to live the Christian life. One thing I remember back that my, my father-in-law taught me, and one thing that Pastor Jimenez has said is that the only way you can live the Christian life is, is on purpose. In the same way, if you're going to be in a race, if you're going to win that race, you're not going to win it by accident. You're going to win it on purpose. You're going to win, win it with intention, with objection. Go if you went to Luke chapter 9. Luke 9. And so the Christian life can only be lived on purpose. You're not going to succeed in the Christian life by accident. Don't think that if you're sitting here and you're wondering, I wonder if, if I'm, I'm going to be blessed in the Christian life. I wonder if, if I'm going to finish the race that God has before me. You know, if you're wondering those things, it's probably not going to happen. You must purpose to finish. You must purpose to win. If you have sin in your life that you must overcome, it's not going to happen by accident. You must purpose in your heart to live the Christian life. Luke 9 Look at verse number 61, Luke 9, 61. Luke 9, 61, the Bible says, And another also said, notice, Lord, I will follow thee. Here we have a man who comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, Lord, hey, I'm willing to follow you. Hey, Lord, I'm willing to be a Christian. Hey, Lord, I'm willing to live for you. This man says he wants to do these things. He wants to live for God. But notice, but then he says, But let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at my home, which are at home at my house. Notice this man who says, hey, I'm willing to live that life. Hey, I'm willing to follow the Lord. I'm willing to obey the Bible. But then he says, but, but what? But he has something he's looking behind him. He's, he's bogged down with his mind with something else. And notice the response from Jesus in verse 62. It says, and Jesus said unto him, notice, no man having put his hands to the plow, notice, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. See, it's not possible to live the Christian life if you're going one way, but you're looking a different way. See, this man here, he did not purpose in his heart to follow the Lord. Why? Because while he said he wanted to follow God, while he said he wanted God to clean up his life, all the while his mind was on something else. His mind was on someone else. See, in order to succeed in this life, it's not possible for you to look back and move forward. Right. In the Christian life, you cannot look back. You know, the, the Bible says about Abraham, that Abraham, if he had been mindful of the country from which he came out of, he might have had opportunity to return again. See, when you're looking back in your life, and you're not sure if you should be going forward, looking back will only cause you to go backwards. If you're going to live the Christian life, hey, there's no looking back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. You must look forward. Put your hand to the plow and just purpose in your mind and your heart and say, you know what, I'm going to win. And so if you think about your life, you know, some people wonder, I wonder if I'm going to be in this thing for the long haul. And it's one thing we know, a statistic, is that most people come and go. Most people, after seven years or so, they quit the Christian life. And what, what did it come down to? It came down to the fact that they just didn't purpose in their heart. Because why? Because the struggles will come. The hard times will come. You know, that thing that you're afraid of in your life is going to come. But here's the thing. It comes down to a choice in your heart that you chose to finish the race 
It's a purpose in your heart, and it's something that you must choose for yourself. To be like Daniel, and you purpose, no matter what anyone else does, I'm going to purpose to not defile myself. Go to James chapter 1. James 1, if you would. James chapter 1. See, one thing about David or Daniel is that Daniel, he was not wavering in his decision. Daniel was not doubting about what he should do. Daniel knew what he was going to do. Daniel purposed in his heart, and that's why Daniel was a man who we see of great character, a man of great faith, a man who God protected and God blessed, a man who finished with his course with joy. Why? Because he purposed in his heart. James 1, look at verse number 6. James 1, 6, the Bible says, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Notice, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Notice, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. See, this man here in James 6, he wasn't purposed in his heart to live for God. He wasn't purposed in his heart to finish the race that was set before him. And you in your life, you cannot be double-minded right. in the Christian life. Why? Because the sea will come. The waves will come. You will get knocked around in life. But you, in your heart and in your mind, you must purpose to do what? To live the Christian life. Why? Because you're not going to win in the Christian life by accident. You're going to win when you purpose, when you decide to win. And here's the thing, the only way you can lose in the Christian life is to quit. If you want to win in the Christian life, just purpose in your heart never to quit. Purpose in your heart to stay with it. Purpose in your heart to not defile yourself, to be conformed to this world. Why? Because Babylon, what they want you to do is to leave here and go back to look like one of them. To speak like them, to live like them. And if you're double-minded, you're not going to make it. Because if you're double-minded, whatever you're worried is going to happen is going to happen to you in the Christian life. You know, I remember when I first got saved and I started trying to go to church and living for God and going soul winning. In my mind, I knew that there were things that I had to give up if I was going to live for God. And I, I prayed to God. I said, God, you know what? I know that's the cost, but if that's the cost, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to let it go. And then here's the thing. That's a choice you need to make on your own. In your heart, decide, you know what? I'm not going to waver. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be consistent. I'm not going to let myself to be defiled by Babylon. So, number one, you must purpose to live the Christian life. Why? Because the Christian life can only be won on purpose. And here's the thing. If you, know, if you remember back what Jacob told Reuben, Jacob told Reuben, unstable as waters thou shalt not excel. If you're wavering and unstable, you're not going to make it. So what you, what you should do is you get stable. You should get committed and realize that the, the way to win is to be committed, to be faithful, to be stable. But it comes down to a choice of you purposing in your heart that you're not going to quit. Amen. Purpose in your heart. So tonight, if, if you don't know, hey, I don't know if I'm going to make it in the long haul, then choose right now. Say, God, I'm going to purpose to make this to the end. I'm going to purpose to be a Christian. I'm going to purpose to not change. But it all begins with you making a choice in your heart. Go back to Daniel chapter 1. So what do you see about Daniel? see a man who... A man of great character, a man who did what? That he purposed in his heart. And you, you must purpose to live the Christian life. You're not going to win in the Christian life or in anything on accident. It's going to come with you making a choice in your heart to purpose, to make it your intention, to be resolved to win in the Christian life. But number two, not only should you purpose to live the Christian life, but number two, you should purpose to keep a good testimony. You should purpose to keep a good testimony. Daniel 1, look at verse number 10. The Bible says in verse 10, And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children who are, which are of your sort? Then shall he make me endanger my head to the king. And here we see an interaction between Daniel and the prince of the eunuchs. Now the prince of the eunuchs was not a believer. He was a Babylonian. And notice what he says. He, says. he said in verse 10, he said, I fear my lord of the king. See, the lord of the prince of the eunuchs was the king of Babylon. But Daniel, and I'm sure Daniel feared, feared his lord, the king, which was who? Which was God. Daniel feared the lord. And here we see an interaction between somebody who's not saved and Daniel. It goes on in verse number 11. It says, Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he said, Prove thy servants. What does that mean? He's saying, hey, try me. He's saying, watch me. He said, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. So get the story here. You know, the king of Babylon, he takes Daniel, and he takes his friends, and he wants to give them meat to eat and wine to drink to defile them. 
But the prince of the eunuchs fears the king. And if I don't give you this, Daniel, then the king may kill me. But Daniel says, you know what? Try me. Prove me and give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Verse 13, it says, then let, our, then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. Verse 14, so he consented to them in this matter, notice, and proved them ten days. So here we have the prince of the eunuchs, who he has to give Daniel meat and wine, and Daniel says, you know what? Try me. Prove me. Give me pulse to eat and give me water to drink. And for 10 days, what is the prince of the eunuch doing? He's just watching Daniel. He's just wondering what's going to happen. As he sees everyone else eating of the meat, drinking of the wine, he gives Daniel what? He gives Daniel beans and water. And for 10 days, I could just imagine the prince of the eunuchs just doing what? Just watching Daniel. Just seeing what's going to happen. Seeing, will he continue in this or will he give up? And what you must understand is that you as a Christian, that people are watching you. You may have family that's not saved. You may have friends who are not saved. And you say, what are they doing? They're just watching you. And they're just wondering, you know, what's going to happen with them? What's going to happen with them? They're giving up the meat. They're giving up the drink. And they're choosing this pulse and this water. And they're just watching and they're just wondering, and they're just going to see, hey, is, is, is this person going to make it? Or are they going to fail? And you, as a Christian, you must purpose in your heart to keep a good testimony. Because whether you like it or not, you know, once you got saved and started coming to this church, you now have a testimony. And people are watching you. And people are wondering what is going to happen to this person. And you must purpose in your heart to keep a good testimony. Go, if you would, to Luke, go back to Luke, Luke 14. So understand, when you, when you, in your life, when you purpose to live for God, you must understand that people will be watching you. And people are watching you. Now, whether that's fair or not, you know, that's just life. You know, life is not fair. And whether you want to live that life or not, understand that you have a testimony. And your testimony could either be a great victory for the cause of Christ, or it could be a great shame for the cause of Christ. It really depends on what you want to do with your life. But understand that people are watching you, and people are wondering what's going to happen to you. Luke 14, look at verse number 28. Luke 14, verse 28, the Bible says, For which of you, notice, intending to build. Here we have someone who wants to build their life, who says, hey, I'm going to build my life for God. I'm going to clean up my life. I'm going to live right. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Verse 29, lest happily... After he had, notice, laid the foundation, this person began to build this tower. The foundation was laid. Hey, people knew, hey, look at this, the foundation's been laid. And in the same way, hey, once you start going to church, once you start going soul winning, once they see you cleaning up your life, changing the way you dress, stopping, stop watching what you're doing, stop drinking what you're drinking, hey, the foundation has been laid. People are already watching you. But notice what it says, and is not able to finish it. Notice, all that behold it begin to mock him. See, you know, truth is, you know, people, they don't want you, they don't want you to succeed. And you must understand that they're waiting to mock at you. They're waiting to laugh at you. Look at verse 30. It says, saying, notice, this man began to build and was not able to finish. You know, oftentimes the reason why we don't begin building for God is because we're afraid of people mocking us. We're afraid of being made fun of, but you know what? They mocked the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross over and over. You know, he died for you. Is it okay for you in your life if people just mock you a little bit? You know, nobody's asking you to die on a cross. Nobody's asking you to pay for some sins. So why don't you just choose to, hey, are they going to talk about you? Yes, they're going to talk about you. Will they lie about you? Yes, they will lie about you. Will they make fun of you? Yes, they will. But you know what? Who cares? Amen. Just endure the cross. You know, it makes no difference what the world does. This world hates your Savior who died for you. Can you just please choose to live for God? Amen. And if they mock at you, who cares? Yeah. And the truth is, you know, people hope you fail. And this is my theory. People hope that, you know, that I fail, that you fail. Not because they want you to necessarily fail. But they want you to fail because they're afraid. Because they're afraid, you know what, what if they're right? And the truth is, we are right. The truth is that there is a hell that whether they want to believe it or not, there is only one way. It's not of works. 
if they don't believe on Jesus Christ, they will die and go to hell. And so they want you to fail, not because of you, but because they're afraid that you're right. And look, that you, you ought to have pity for them. That makes me have pity for people who are watching me and they're hoping I fail, because, not because of me, but because they're afraid that we're right. And you know what? We are right. The Bible is the truth. And here's the thing. That should make you have pity on them. Because you know what? They need you to show them that this is real. And it is real. That, that without the Savior, they will die and go to hell. Right, right. And so people are watching you, but understand they may mock you. But deep down, I believe they're mocking because they're afraid yeah. that you're right. And you are right. And so be assured, knowing that, hey, you know what? God is true. The Bible is real. If they don't believe the truth, they're going to die and go to hell. You should have pity on these people and choose to build. And if they mock you, that is a light affliction. That is nothing. Let them make fun of you. It doesn't matter. We have all of eternity. So you should do what you should understand that people, once you live for God, they will be watching you. Go to Matthew 5, if you would. Matthew chapter number 5. And so you should purpose to live a life of having a good testimony. Purpose to live a life of having a good testimony. Go to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, and look verse, look verse number 14. It says, Matthew, Matthew 5, 14. It says, Ye are the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14. It says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. It says in verse 15, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Understand, the Bible says here that ye, you're, you're the light of the world. You are a city that is set on a hill. And in the same way, if you were to look at a hill or a mountain, and you see a city up there, look, you can't hide that city. It's, it's, you, you can see it. You can watch it. It says, that, it says what? It says you're a candle. And the reason people light up a candle is to give light to an entire room. And when you light a candle, you don't put it under a bushel to hide it. You do it so that people can see in the room. And notice verse 16, it says, notice, let your light so shine before men. In the same way that you cannot hide a city that is on a hill, God says, you know what? In the same way, you ought to let your light so shine before men. Sounds like God doesn't want you to be ashamed that you're a Christian. Sounds like God doesn't want you to be ashamed that you believe the Bible, that you go soul and that you go to church. You shouldn't be ashamed of your things. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men. Notice that they may see what? That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, God wants people, you know, God wants you to show people what? Your good works. And let God be glorified in those things. See, God doesn't mind you being different. In fact, God wants you to be different. God wants you to stand out in the world. God wants you to shine in the world full of darkness, full of wickedness. The Bible says that God wants to purify to himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. What does it mean to be peculiar? It means to be different. And look, this world wants to conform men to look like sodomites. That's ridiculous. You know, you as a man look like a man. And here's the thing, you should let your works glorify God. Meaning what? Meaning you should be a soul winner. You should be faithful at church. You should read your Bible. Don't let these things shame you. The, the world should be ashamed for the wickedness and the filth that they enjoy today. But you as a Christian, you ought to let your light so shine before men. It's okay. If people see that you're different, you know what? Praise the Lord. You're supposed to be different. And don't allow a little mockery to scare you. You know, boldness is something that we as Christians ought to have. Being bold is a quality of being filled with the Spirit. And so as Christians, you have to understand that your, your testimony has power. And you ought to endeavor, purpose in your heart to have a good testimony because people are watching you. And your testimony has value and it has great power for people in your life. Go if you would to Acts chapter number 11. Acts chapter number 11. And obviously in our churches, we don't believe in lifestyle evangelism. Obviously we believe in confrontational soul winning where we go door to door and we give people the gospel. So this, this is not a substitute for soul winning. But you know what? Your testimony still has a lot of power. See, once, you're, once your friends who are not saved or your family who's not saved, once they hear, hey, the foundation was laid, they began to go into church, they began trying to live for God, they began this little fad. But once they see you quit, what does that tell them about, the, about Christianity? It tells them it doesn't work. It tells them it's not real. It tells them it's just a phase. But once they see you consistent, not changing, year to year, growing, staying the same, God blessing you, God helping you, that has great value. And then they begin to see little by little and say, you know what? Maybe he's right. Maybe he does have something to show me. But when you quit and then you fail, 
people will mock at that, and you know what? It's not going to help your testimony. It's not going to help them get saved. It's just going to be something that people look at and say, you know what? It was just a phase. It's not real. Acts chapter 11, look at verse number 26. Acts 11, 26. It says, and when he had found him, in verse 26, here we have, it says when he had found him, it talked about Paul, he brought him unto Antioch. Notice, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. Notice, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. You have to understand about the word Christian is that the people of Antioch, they saw these people who were different. These people who stood out from the crowd that were not like the world, and as a mocking term, they referred to them as Christians. And you know, praise the Lord for it. I'm glad today to be identified as a Christian. And you ought to be proud and glad to be identified as a Christian. Something that the world once came up with as a mockery, but you know, God turned that into a blessing. And praise the Lord that we can be called Christians today. But here's the thing, they were identified by, as Christians by what? By their works by what they did, by the way they lived their life. So you in your life say, hey, I don't want to be different. But you know what? God wants you to be different. God wants you to conform to the image of his dear son, not conform to the image of what the king of Babylon wants you to do. Amen. So what should you do? Number one, you should purpose to live the Christian life. But number two, you should purpose to keep a good testament. Go back to Daniel chapter number one, Daniel one. And when you look at Daniel, we see that Daniel, he kept his good testimony. Daniel one, look at verse number 15. Daniel 1 15 it says and at the end of the 10 days in verse 15 notice their countenances appeared fair and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat notice verse 16 thus Mel Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulls you know I wonder what kind of impact this had on the prince of the eunuchs and on, and on Melzar here who when they see Daniel deciding to live for God deciding to not change and Daniel fulfilling his course, I wonder what sort of impact that had on the Prince of the Eunuchs. He probably thought, you know what, man, there's something to the God of Daniel for what just happened. And in the same way, that, that could be your testimony. When your friends and your family, while they may mock you right now, you changing your life, being faithful, purposing your heart not to quit, you staying in it, that can have a great influence and impact on the people in your life. So you should choose purpose in your heart to do it, to keep a good testimony. Because whether you like it or not, people are watching you. You know, I don't like to be watched, but you know what? People are going to watch you. And you know what? That's okay. You got to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So number one, this evening, you got a purpose to live the Christian life. Why? Because you're not going to win by accident. It's going to be done on purpose. Number two, you have a purpose to keep a good testimony. But number three, you got a purpose to have the right attitude. Purpose to have the right attitude. Look at verse number 12, Daniel 1, 12. The Bible says, notice, he says, prove thy servants. He says, watch me and test me. I beseech thee ten days and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Look at verse 13. Notice, then let our countenances be looked upon before thee. Notice, and the countenance of the children of the, that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. You got a purpose to have the right attitude. Here we have Daniel telling the prince of the eunuchs, he says, you know what, prove thy servant, try me. And then what does he say? And then he says, watch, he says, let our countenance be looked upon. He's saying, look at my face. You see, what is your countenance? Your countenance is a, it's a person's face or it's a facial expression. And I can imagine Daniel after 10 days, could you picture Daniel looking sad or disgruntled or moping over what just happened? Daniel said, you know what, look at my face and look at their face. Look at my attitude and look at their attitude. I'm sure Daniel was not acting like he was sick, acting like he was depressed, acting like he was upset. I'm sure Daniel was just happy. And here's the thing. You, in your life, you got to have the right attitude. you got a purpose in your life to have the right attitude. Why? Because it not only matters what you do, but it matters how you do it. God wants you to have the right attitude in the things that you do. And you can tell the right attitude by the countenance of the face. You can look at someone's face and you can see, you know what, this person doesn't care about what I'm talking about. They don't care about the Bible. They, they, they think they're doing right, but here's the thing. God wants you to do right, but God cares about your attitude too. God wants you to have the right countenance. Have the right attitude in the Christian life. Why? Because it not only matters what you do, but how you do it. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Go to Matthew 6. And so you get a purpose to have the right attitude. Daniel, who was in prison, he said, try me. And after 10 days, hey, look at my face. And they look at their face. 
Why? Because you got to have the right attitude. I'm sure Daniel was not upset. Daniel did not have a face of being disgruntled. He wasn't forced to do it. I'm sure Daniel looked happy. He looked pleasant. And you got to have the right attitude. Matthew 6, look verse number 16, the Bible says, notice, moreover, in verse 16, it says, moreover, when ye fast, notice, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. It says, when you fast, don't be like a hypocrite where you have a sad countenance. Notice, for they do what? For they disfigure their faces that they might appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Notice, but thou, when thou fastest, notice, anoint thine head and wash thy face. See, why would somebody want to look disgruntled when they're fasting? Because they want to make it, they want to act like they're so spiritual. And like it's this big chore. But you know, God wants you to have a different attitude. God doesn't want you to act like it's a, it's a heavy burden or it's a chore. God wants you to be happy. He wants you to anoint your head. He wants you to be cheerful when you do it. He wants you to have the right attitude. Verse number 18, it says, notice that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. See, God says here that when you fast, you ought to have the right attitude when you fast. You say, does God want me to fast? He wants you to fast, but he wants you to fast with the right attitude. Does God want you to go to church? He wants you to go to church, but he wants you to go to church with the right attitude, with a happy countenance. Does God want you kids to obey your parents? He wants you to obey, but with the right attitude. You know, one thing we teach our daughters is that they must obey right away, but with a smile and have the right attitude. It's not right for our kids to obey us with the wrong attitude. That is disobedience. Right, amen. And we as God's children, when we, when we take orders from the Lord, we should do it with the right attitude. You know, men at work, you got to obey your boss, but obey him with a right attitude attitude. In church, when you come to church, you come with the right attitude. You don't come upset. You don't come disgruntled because God's not pleased with that. God says, when you fast, hey, don't look like you're disgruntled. Don't look like you're upset. Hey, anoint your head. Be happy. Have the right attitude and do it. Why? Because as children of God, we should be joyful people. I'm sure Daniel wasn't complaining. Daniel was just happy doing what he was going to do. And you in the same way, God wants you to have the right attitude in your life. Go to Philippians 2. Philippians chapter number 2. So you got a purpose in your life to have the right attitude. You say, is it done on purpose? It's done on purpose. And if you're someone who's always upset, always disgruntled, you ought to change that. You say, that's just how I am. You know what? You're choosing to be like that. You ought to choose to have the right attitude. Philippians 2, look at verse number 14. Philippians 2, 14. Notice what it says. It says, do all things. That is a command from God. God says, hey, do all things. But notice it says, without murmurings and disputings. You say, does God want me to do all things? Yeah, God wants me to do all things. Is God pleased when I do all things? He's pleased when you do all things, notice, without murmurings and disputings. See, God wants you to do all things having what? Having the right attitude. And don't think, hey, I come to church three times a week. If you're here with the wrong attitude, that's not right. God wants you to have the right attitude. If you're, if you're going to work with the wrong attitude, that's not right either. God wants you to obey your boss as unto the Lord. Wives, when, God, when you're supposed to submit to your husband, you're supposed to do it with the right attitude. That's what God wants from you. The Bible says, do all things, notice, without murmurings and disputings. Notice verse 15, it says, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, notice, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. See, in this world of wickedness and perverseness, one of the ways we shine as lights in the world is not just what we do, but it's how we do it. So you can do right, but you can do right in the wrong way. You can obey God, but you can obey God with the wrong attitude and God will not be pleased. And here's the thing, if you're going to live the Christian life, you got to realize that God wants you to do all things, but he wants you to do all things with the right attitude, without murmurings, without disputing. So what is a murmuring? A murmuring is a subdued or private expression of discontent or dissatisfaction. And the truth is, hey, people can see it on the countenance. People can see it in the faces of people when they're just discontented, they're disgruntled, things aren't going their way. God doesn't want you to have that attitude. God wants you to have the do all things, but with the right attitude. What is disputing? Just arguing, complaining all the time. Look, you can do right, but you can do right in the wrong way. When our kids obey us, but they, dis but they obey us with the, wrong, with the wrong attitude, that is not right. And we need to correct that in the same way as God's people. We got to do things, obey the Lord, obey the Lord, but with the right attitude. And so the question is, you know, when the world sees you, do they see someone who's just disgruntled, who's just upset? Or do they see someone with a good countenance, with the right attitude, 
happy to serve the Lord. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. The Bible says rejoice evermore. We as God's people should be happy people. And no matter what affliction or trial, whatever we think we're going through, we should go through it with a right attitude and obey the Lord in the right way. It is not right to obey God having the wrong attitude. And there's no reward. God doesn't like that. God is not pleased. The Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. As God's people, we should be happy. Do all things having the right attitude. Go back to Daniel chapter 1. If you would, Daniel 1. So number 1, this evening, I said you got a purpose to live the Christian life. Why? Because the Christian life will not be won by accident. Number 2, you got a purpose to keep a good testimony. Because whether you like it or not, people are watching you. Number 3, you got a purpose to have the right attitude. And number 4, this evening, Daniel, Daniel 1, look at verse number 9. Well, number four this evening, you got a purpose to not be rude. Purpose to not be rude. Now, this one I wrote specifically for, for a day like today. A day where knowledge is definitely increasing, but you know what? Unfortunately, grace is not increasing. A day where we're so right that we're so right that we become jerks about it and everyone else is just an idiot. And so in our lives, we got to see like Daniel, we had a purpose to not be rude as God's people. Daniel 1, look at verse number 9. Daniel 1, 9, the Bible says, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Notice what it says. It says that God brought Daniel into what? Into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. See, could you imagine Daniel being rude to this man? Being a jerk to this man? You think this man would love and care for Daniel if he was rude to him? If he was impolite and he was just a jerk to him? No. I'm sure Daniel was a, was a kind man. Daniel was not rude. And what did God do? He, he brought into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Verse 10, it says, And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall he make me endanger my head to the king. And then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Notice what he says in verse 12. He says, prove, notice, thy servants. Notice the respect that Daniel had for Melzar. He said, prove thy servants. See, he was being respectful. He was being kind. He was submitting himself unto, the, unto Melzar, who was over him in the prison. He says, prove thy servants. Notice, I beseech thee. Here we have Daniel being a very humble man. He says, I beg you. He's not being rude. He's not being forceful. He's not being a jerk. He's being respectful, and he's being humble. It says, I beseech thee ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. You see, test, Daniel had a testimony of not being a jerk, of not being rude. And here's the thing, it's done on purpose. And you, in your life, as you go soul winning, as you deal with your unsaved friends, as you deal with your unsaved loved ones, you got a purpose in your life to not be rude. Amen. Purpose in your life to not be a jerk. Purpose in your life to not just think you know it all. Because you think just because you're saved, yes, you're saved, doesn't make you smarter than, than the whole world. And today we see an attitude that says, just because I'm saved and I have the truth, then I'm just, I, have a, I have a past to be a jerk to everyone. But that's not right. You ought to be kind to people. You ought to show humility. You ought to be respectful. Because usually people are not going to respond to you when you're just a jerk to them. Right. Go if you would to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2. So number four, you've got, you got a purpose to not be rude. And it's done on purpose. Will people be rude to you? Yes, but you got a purpose in your heart to not be rude to people. And oftentimes, I feel like when we get saved, you know, we're so right about salvation that we, we're just jerks to our unsaved loved ones. And I, I've been, you know, at fault at this. When I first got saved, you know, maybe we get overzealous and we just kind of want to cram the truth down people's throat and we do it in the wrong way. We do the right thing, but we do it with the wrong attitude and it turns out to backfire on us. And it's not right. 2 Timothy 2, look at verse number 24. 2 Timothy 2, 24, the Bible says, And the servant of the Lord must not, what? Must not strive. What does that mean? You ought to not be someone who's always striving, getting into fights, arguing, striving with people. Notice, but be, what? But be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach, notice, patient. See, when it comes to dealing with people out soul winning, the Bible says we ought not to be quick to strive. You know, if you're someone who's constantly getting into fights out soul winning, and, you know, one thing that our pastor always says is, is that we, we're supposed to contend for the faith, but not to be contentious. And if you're just constantly out there getting fight after fight after fight at every single door, there's something wrong with you. And the Bible says here that the servant of the Lord must not strive, but do what? But be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach. Notice patient. Notice what it says in verse 25. In what? In meekness. That's humility. 
that's being approachable. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. So when it comes to the world, dealing with the world, the Bible says we've got to be gentle unto all men. Not quick to strive, not quick to fight, to do what? To instruct them, to help them, to recover them out of the snare of the devil. See, people don't know that they're in a trap. And it doesn't help when we go to them and we're rude and we're just trying to fight them and cram things down the throat. We need to help them see the light. Because these people are blinded. And what blind people need is a guide to help them, not somebody to push them down and step all over them. And sometimes we use our salvation, and I'm a Baptist, to put ourselves above people and step on them down. But people don't need that. You know, obviously once in a while we go so we get into fights, we get into arguments, we get in the flesh, that happens. But if it's happening again and again and again, then you're the problem. Why? Because a servant of the Lord must not strive, but be apt to teach. Go to Ephesians 4, if you would. Ephesians chapter number 4. So we see Daniel doing what? We see Daniel purposing to what? To not be rude. He was respectful. He was humble. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, look at verse number 13. It says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. In Ephesians 4, verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See, God says he wants us to become a perfect man, a complete Christian. Notice, that we henceforth be what? Be no more children. And when it says no more children, it doesn't mean that you're just a child by physical age. It means that there are people who are adults physically, but that they may be babes in Christ. They may be still young in the faith, children in the faith, tossed to and fro, in verse 14, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Notice verse 15, but, but what? But speaking the truth in love. You see, like Daniel, you could be a man that you can have the truth, but you can spread the truth in a loving way. See, one of the signs of Christian maturity is you being able to have the truth and to be able to spread the truth in a loving way. To speak the truth, but in love, with meekness. It says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So when it comes to you at the door, or how about this, when it comes to you with your unsaved loved ones, with your unsaved family, you know, what do they think about when they talk to you? Do they think, man, this person just keeps bombarding me, ramming things down my throat? Or do they see someone with meekness, gentleness, speaking the truth, having the truth? Yes, not compromising on the truth, but speaking the truth in love. And so here's the thing. Don't use your salvation as a green card or as a pass to just step all over people. Because God wants you to speak the truth, but he wants you to do it in a loving way, to be respectful, to be kind, to not be rude. So like Daniel, hey, you can have the truth, but you know what? He was still respectful. And he still humbled himself under the authority that God put over him. And he spake the truth, what? In love. So you in your life as a Christian, when you go out and deal with the world, hey, purpose in your heart to not be rude to people. And it's done on purpose. Don't say, oh, that's just how I am. Well, then you got to change. And learn to have some meekness and gentleness and become a servant of the Lord, someone who is gentle with meekness, apt to teach. Not striving, right? Speaking the truth in love. So a good test is, hey, how do you treat your unsaved loved ones? Are you rude to them? Are you a jerk to them? Do you force things down their throat? Or do they say, hey, this person, they love me. They're kind to me. They're respectful to me. Why? Because you can have the truth, but you could spread it in a wrong way. So you got to have the right attitude. And we do it and purpose in your heart to not be rude. Go back to Daniel chapter 1, if you would. Daniel 1. So tonight, you got a purpose in your heart to, number one, to live the Christian life. You will not win in anything. You will not win in the Christian life by accident. It will be done only on purpose when you choose to do it. Number two, you have a purpose in your, in your heart to keep a good testimony, because whether you like it or not, you now have a testimony. The foundation has been laid. Number three, you have a purpose to have the right attitude. God is not pleased with you doing right in the wrong way. God wants you to do right with the right attitude. Number four, you have a purpose to not be rude, like Daniel. And here we see, in Daniel 1, we see God blessing Daniel in the end. Daniel 1, look at verse number 16 again. It says, Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat, and the wine that they should drink, and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them, notice, knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said that he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, 
and the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were, all, that were in all his realm. And here we see that God, that he did what for Daniel? He, that he blessed him. That God gave Daniel what? He gave him knowledge. He gave him skill. The king of Babylon saw him ten times better than everyone else. And here's the thing. In Daniel 1, before Daniel got to Babylon, he didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know God would bless him. He didn't know God would be with him. But you know what? He purposed in his heart to do what's right. And you in your life, you don't know what God can do in your life. You don't know what can happen five years down the road, ten years down the road, twenty years down the road. But it begins, what, it begins with you purposing in your heart. To make decisions in your heart. To decide, hey, you know what? I'm not going to change. I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to live for God. No matter who else leaves, no matter who else changes, no matter who else quits on God, I'm going to purpose in my heart to do what's right. To live the Christian life to keep a good testimony, to have the right attitude, and to not be rude. Why? Because that is the way we win in the Christian life. We win by being stable, by being committed to not quitting on the Lord. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for this church, and I just pray that you be with everyone in here, and I just pray that you continue to bless this church and to help them continue to do this great work, God. And I just thank you for the opportunity to preach your word, and I ask that you bless the rest of the evening, God. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.